Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you, Julia and Jason for putting this together. And I have to really thank you because I so wanted to have a conversation with these two amazing women and curators. And I wanted to do it before the election. And I wanted to really speak to the importance of the 19th Amendment allowing women to vote. So I am thrilled that this all came together and I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces. Dina Matrani from Miami is here. Uh, Marina Font, a lot of the artists that are in the, um, in the show are here. And um, it just really speaks to the power of community. So anyway, let me let you know who these two amazing people are. Um, Frances Jakubek is a photographer, curator, and advocate for photography. She is the director of exhibitions and operations at the Bruce Silverstein Gallery in New York City. And I got to know her when she was the associate curator of the Griffin Museum of Photography in Winchester, Massachusetts. And we were all devastated when she left, but she went to a fabulous new job in New York City. Um, her recent curatorial appoint appointments include Surrender Deer at the Umbrella Arts Gallery in New York, Drawing the Line at the Bruce Silverstein Gallery in New York, Grief on New York Photo Curator and the Refrigerator Curator in Boston, Massachusetts. Her personal work focuses on self-portraiture and how the body is perceived in different contexts. Her photographs have been exhibited at the Southern Contemporary Gallery in Charleston, South Carolina, Filter Space Chicago, Camera Commons, New Hampshire, and the Hess Gallery in Pine Manor College, Massachusetts. She's been a guest writer for various publications and for artist monographs, including Sarah Russell's Tears, Tears, which is a fabulous book by, was it Yaffe Press? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, she has been a panelist for the Massachusetts Cultural Cancer's Photography Fellowship, speaker for the Photo Brigade, and juror for exhibitions throughout the US, including United Photo Industries, The Fence, and PDN's Curator Awards. Welcome, Francis. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ellen. And, and um, to the wonderful Meg Griffiths, who was born in Indiana and raised in Texas. She received a Bachelor of Arts degrees from the University of Texas in Cultural Anthropology and English Literature and earned her Master of Fine Arts in Photography from the Savannah College of Art and Design. She currently lives in Denton, Texas, where she, was the, she is the Assistant Professor of Photography in the Department of Visual Art at Texas Women's University. Her photographic research currently deals with domestic, economic, historical, and cultural relationships across Southern United States and Cuba. And if you haven't seen Meg's Cuba work, you're in for a treat. I, I happen to own several of the pieces from that series and just love it. Her work has traveled nationally as well as internationally and is placed in collections such as the Center for Creative Photography, Capital One Collection, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and the Center of Fine Art Photography. Her books, both monographs as well as collaborative projects have been acquired by various institutions around the country, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Duke University Libraries, Museum of Modern Art, University of Virginia, University of Iowa, Maryland Institute, College of Art, uh, Ringling College of Art, and Washington and Lee University, just to name a few. She was honored as PDN's, uh, one of PDN's 30 new and emerging photographers in 2012, named one of eight emerging photographers at the Blue Spiral Gallery in 2015. Atlanta celebrates photography once to watch in 2016 and was awarded the Julia Margaret Cameron Prize for best fine art series in 2017 and won second place prize at Photo NOLA in 2000. 19. So welcome, Meg. 
both of these women I consider dear friends and I am so admiring of their efforts and am so excited to share this really profound effort that they have put together called a Yellow Rose Project. So I'm gonna hand it over to um, Meg and Francis. They are going to um, speak for about an hour and go through all the work. Um, and then we're gonna open it up for questions. I have my own questions, but I don't want this to go on for hours. So we will, um, we'll just see how it goes. So um, anyway, welcome Meg and Francis. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so yeah, I wanna say thank you, Aileen, um, for inviting us and Jason and Julia and Brandon, we're honored to be the start, I guess, of this series that you're doing um, at LACP in this new sort of virtual environment. So we'll just get started. Um, we are gonna to talk tonight about a yellow rose, Francis and I, and at the beginning, we're gonna try and run a video. If there's any issues, um, Jason's going to put the link to this video in the chat. So on August 18th, 2020, marked the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, stating, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. In the summer of 1920, 35 of the 36 states necessary had ratified the 19th Amendment. California was one of those states having ratified the amendment on November 1st, 1919. Eight states had rejected the amendment and five had not voted. Suffragists saw Tennessee as their last best hope for ratification before 1920 presidential election. Governor Albert H. Roberts called a special session of the General Assembly on August 9th to consider the issue in Tennessee. Pro-suffrage and anti-suffrage activists from around the state and the country descended on Nashville in intent on influencing the legislature. It was on that day in August, 100 years ago, women wearing yellow roses stood shoulder to shoulder in Tennessee, awaiting the roll call of men that would cast their votes for or against a woman's right to a voice in government. The bright flower was a small outward symbol of their expression to gain equal representation. After decades of untold risk through oppression, brutality, incarceration, and even starvation, women fought against insurmountable odds to gain the right to be a part of the democratic process. And it all came down to one vote, one letter, written from one mother, Phoebe Ensmeager Byrne, to her 24-year-old son, Harry, a newly elected state legislator. And she wrote, for all women, imploring him, her good boy, to vote for ratification and give women the freedom to choose, participate, and be heard alongside men. Grasping mm -hmm. that letter while wearing the red rose of opposition, for mind you, he was planning on voting against suffrage. He read those words from his mother, stood up, said I in favor of women's vote, and ended years of ceaseless struggle, and we might add, enfranchised white women. Though this movement granted rights to some women, and this achievement in itself is to be acknowledged and commemorated, the struggle did not end there. It was not until much later that all American women, regardless of race, were given the same privilege. Due to state laws and prohibitive policies, many women of color were unable to exercise the same privilege, even given this momentous event. In light of these facts, we look upon this part of our history from various perspectives inviting both a critical eye as well as one that sees how far we have come. Lisa Tetrell, author of The Myth of Seneca Falls, Memory in the Women's Movement writes, what we remember, what we forget matters. That in looking back, even upon this remarkable as well as troubled history, we must be thoughtful in the present. In this moment in time, we are meant to honor the historical significance of events such as these, as well as re-examine the narratives that have been shared, rewritten, and erased. It is in part up to women as creator of, creators of our own culture to shape how we tell and share our history. Finding inspiration in the power of these women to shape and influence both public and personal perception, personal and public perception, when gathered for a higher calling, we launched this photographic collaboration, a Yellow Rose Project. We invited photographers sourcing from nominations from respected women in the field, our personal networks, as well as women we admired and had hoped to work with. 
to submit five photographs that directly or indirectly reflect, react, or respond to the 19th, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Interpretation of this was left up to the artists. So we knew from the outset that we wanted to share varied visions. We wanted women of culture, women of all ages, women at all stages of their careers to be a part of this project. In order to have a rich and thoughtful response to this anniversary, which is not an anniversary for all to celebrate, we wanted to invite a diverse group of women whose perspectives would not be the same. It was through my research that I came across a quote by Sojourner Truth, and it has been a guiding phrase for me. I found it in a brilliant essay by Martha S. Jones called The Politics of Black Womanhood, 1848-2008. Martha shares this by Truth, who states that women's fates were linked, but not because they were the same. This statement made more than 100 years ago rings true then as it does now. We walk this path of womanhood. It is by no means the same, but those paths intersect and affect one another. So although there are 105 women who are participating in this project, our original ask was something over 200. Now keep in mind, just because we asked women to participate does not mean there was always a yes on the other end. There are a number of reasons for this. We were essentially commissioning women to make work with no compensation, except a hope and a promise that Francis and I would do what we could to make this project a success. Could we ensure this? No. And were we the MoMA? No. And this is something I thought a lot about when sending out the letter originally. Who are we to ask? And would these women take a leap of faith to work with us? And the answer we kept coming back to was, if you don't ask, you will never know. So our promise was one of labor and time and energy in return for the same. It went into trying to find ways to promote and share the work, creating opportunities like shows, a book, and a place to house their work in a virtual archive. This was something we offered in exchange for creative content. We also understand the full weight and complication of the centennial as we are acknowledging and questioning it today. Like so many of our written histories and anniversaries, there were women all across the country, even with the ratification of the 19th Amendment that did not get the freedom to vote due to prohibitive policies and state laws, such as literacy tests and poll taxes. To this day, we have modern day versions of these injustices, such as redistricting, complicated registration requirements, and voter suppression tactics. Choosing to make work about this complicated anniversary and asking women to step away from other very important work to do this one now, well, that is the right of every woman to decide how they want to spend their time, labor, and energy. Right now, we have a lot of work to do in our country, a lot of important projects, and a lot of work really to undo as well. So making or not making work, it is about the right to choose. We chose the yellow rose as our symbol and icon for various reasons. Yellow flowers such as daffodils, sunflowers, and roses were all symbols worn in support of the suffrage movement in the US as well as other countries. In Europe, it was the jonquil or yellow daffodil, which was adopted by the US. Various states also had their own symbols. Kansas adopted the yellow sunflower as their suffrage flower. It was specifically a story told about the yellow rose worn by women on August 18, 1920, at a special session of the Tennessee Assembly that interested us. Women from all over the country traveled to Nashville and lobbied for months to convince legislators to vote for a women's right to vote and therefore a seat at the table of government. Suffragists wore yellow roses and anti-suffragist red. One was an expression to gain equal representation, the other a show of power to keep women out of the booths and in the home. Naturally, we wanted to choose a symbol that had a strong connection to this part of women's history and to the movement. When we originally conceived of this project, we always loved the idea of a Yellow Rose project being a virtual entity, something accessible that could expand and grow. Being online also provides the capacity for the photographs to be interacted with beyond the limited exchange in a physical gallery space. With free and continuous access, we are hoping that viewers will also take the time to read to read the provided artist statements and biographies of each of the photographers. With that being said, the fact that the work will be on view in different locations is a tremendous opportunity for local communities beyond our virtual reach to engage with the work. Each destination has and will have a different selection of images in printed form, always supported by a slideshow component featuring every participant. I'm looking forward to seeing how this project will continue to transcend the web platform 
and inhabit different parts of the country. So far, we have had physical exhibitions at the University of New Mexico, the Colorado Photographic Arts Center in Denver, and future shows happening at Texas Christian University and Texas Women's University, which Meg installed today. Uh, virtual programming featuring the work of all of the participating artists has been featured at Indiana U University in Bloomington for Equality Day, the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum at Hollins University, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, and Truman University in Missouri, with a lot more to happen in the next coming months. We have been in conversation with the University Press to create a book of all of the work, and I think being published binds the photographs and the community of image makers together to mark this very specific moment in time. And this project is based on America's history and to add this visual component to the record is very important and very special to us. So the breadth of work you see in this video and what you can experience in our archive um, online presents a contemporary collection of expression prompted by this troubled yet remarkable historical event. The images speak to the movement leading up to ratification, the legacy we have inherited because of it, and the work we will continue to do as a result of it. Some images draw upon personal histories and share with us a glimpse into the present lived experience. This can be seen through intimate portraits of others or the self, domestic spaces, protest scenes, and documentation of the here and now. Other visuals use archival images, new news clippings, or writing to speak about erasure, recovery, and remembering. Themes surrounding the body and gesture come into play in various ways, alluding to issues of power, sexuality, choice, vulnerability, and endurance. We also see generations of women represented and connected, whether that be within the images or by those who authored them. The resulting body of work imbues the power, responsibility, and unique complication of being a woman in the United States from a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. The project aims to show the undeniable strength and resiliency we possess as a whole when united for a higher purpose. So the goal of a Yellow Rose project is to provide a focal point and platform for these image, image makers across the United States to respond to the centennial of this event, bridging the past, present, and on to the future. So we just have a little bit more of this video to go. So we'll let you just enjoy. So what you see here is um, one photograph from um, each of the 105 artists that are participating in the project. Okay, so now that we got to see a piece from everybody, we wanted to highlight a few of the artists that created imagery in response to this call. So we're gonna begin with Rachel Phillips, an artist who oftentimes uses alternative processes and techniques in her work that revolve around a frequent theme and desire to reanimate and rework vernacular photographs to reflect a modern perspective. She is on the board of Medium San Diego and featured the project as an Instagram takeover on the release day in August. She also tutors children with learning differences in the San Francisco Bay Area, in addition to her photography practice. This work is displayed as actual size envelopes. Phillip's works for this project are tactile and encourage the viewer to be an active participant. The employment of the envelope, I feel, is really strong here, especially with the current issues regarding mail in ballots with the United States Postal Service being under extreme pressure. The physical counterbalance of her works contrasts our overwhelmingly virtual world. She calls her series Growing Pains and her statement reads, for this series, I began with a few literal nods to the historical artifacts and symbols of the suffrage movement. The yellow envelope used by Phoebe Burns to write to her son asking him to vote for women and the symbolic yellow rose worn by suffragettes and their supporters. To these elements, I added photographs made by pioneering professional photographer, Francis Benjamin Johnston around 1899. I chose to work with scans of Johnston's photographs, including several antique cyanotype prints for several reasons. 
First, I found them visually striking in their own way, representative of the strength, struggle, and aspiration of the women's movement. Also, I respected Johnston as a champion of photography as a profession for women. Finally, looking back at word work made by Johnston two decades before the 19th Amendment passed, I realized how that particular moment sits in a historical continuum. Women work to become self-realized and equal members of society long before suffrage and ambiguity, imperfection, and struggle toward that ideal still exists today, a hundred years on. I wanted to feature this self-portrait by Francis Benjamin Johnston from 1898, which has always been a big deal for me since I began studying photography. She declared this image as the new woman, cigarette in one hand, beer sign in the other, and is a clear example of how Johnston challenged stereotypical gender roles and played a part in the development of the medium. She studied different processes and was instrumental in advancements in lighting for photography and was the first person to photograph Teddy Roosevelt and gain trust for the camera as well as the photographic process. She was later on appointed as White House photographer. And any biography I've read of women working in the field have always placed focus on the marital status of the photographer and I'd love to finally give her her privacy there. Cindy Huang also dove into the archives with her series called The Forgotten Suffragette, which highlights women activists of color who made invaluable contributions to their communities, yet have been largely overshadowed by their white contemporaries. The series resurfaces newspaper clippings about the women, but obscures their portraits, a visual indication of our collective racially inflected forgetting. Cindy is an artist and designer currently based in New Haven, Connecticut, who explores intersections between politics and aesthetics, using language and commonplace forms to complicate assumptions about the present. Some notable women of color included here in her project are um, Mary Church Terrell, who's an African-American suffragist who championed racial equality and women's suffrage in the late 19th and early 20th century. She is a graduate of Oberlin College, president of the National Association of Colored Women, and the originator of the phrase, and so lifting as we climb. Mabel Pinghua Li was a Chinese advocate for women's suffrage in the United States as well. She was an advocate or an activist at a very young age and helped lead a suffrage parade in 1912, which won her a write-up in the New York Times as, quote, the symbol of the new era, when all women will be free and unhampered. Despite her involvement in activism, she was, however, unable to participate in the election when of age, even with the passing of the 19th Amendment due to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which prevented Chinese immigrants from obtaining citizenship and voting. Li would go on to graduate from Barnard, receive her master's degree in educational administration at Columbia Teachers College, and then attended Columbia University, where she became the first Chinese woman to graduate with a PhD in economics in 1921. Yet it would take 25 years for Lee to be graduated or granted the right to vote with the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943. Contrasted with Cindy's project who eliminated the image and focused on the erasure of the activist in history, Noelle McLeaf turns inward and projects everlasting images for these suffragists. McLeaf is an exhibiting artist and educator who lives and works in Venice, Florida. She is currently full-time faculty in photography and imaging at the Ringling College of Art and Design. Her work focus at, focuses on sacred spaces and objects that encourage storytelling and connections between subjects and in turn the audience. Noelle's work for a Yellow Rose project kept with the theme of ineffable, ineffable qualities of objects and their power to educate and recognize great figures. She composed altars, which are religious structures where offerings are given to gods or goddesses for five suffragists, including Inez Milholland, who is an American suffragist and labor lawyer. She is best known for, the 19, for leading the 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade in Washington, DC, dressed in a flowing white cloak and crown and riding a horse. She is a she was a passionate advocate for women's rights, socialism, and pacifism, most famously known for her last publicly spoken words to Woodrow Wilson before her early death at the age of 30, Mr. President, how long must we wait for liberty? McLeaf also created altars for co-founders of the Women's Party, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. 
And this altar is for Marie Louise Bottineau Baldwin. Baldwin moved from North Dakota to Washington DC with her father to defend the rights of Turtle Mountain Chippewa Nation. There they became part of an established community of professional Native Americans who lived and worked in the capital. In 1904, President Theodore Roosevelt appointed Marie as a clerk in the Office of Indian Affairs. Instead of assimilating to fit a European American society, Marie emphasized the value of traditional Native cultures while asserting her own place in the modern, modern world as an Indian woman. In 1911, she chose to wear Native dress and to braid her hair for her government personnel file. You can see reference to the braids in this picture by McLeaf. Susan K. Grant was also inspired by researching notable women from the past. And to note, she is also a notable woman. An artist, bookmaker, and educator from Dallas-Fort Worth area, she is also my predecessor at Texas Women's University. Um, Susan is most well known for her series entitled Night Journeys, which represent a significant collaboration of artistic and scientific inquiry into the nature of dreams, memory, and the unconscious. Once again, for this week, we see her deep dive into research and the use of fabricated photography as a means to sharing the results of her findings. As she states, I began the series by researching historic archives for profile images of suffragists to use as inspiration. The final images consist of digitally painted portraits combined with patterned shadow backgrounds built and photographed in my studio. In studying the archival images, I take artistic liberty to determine what I imagine is appropriate hairstyles and clothing for the time period. Next, I create a custom built backdrop of shadows assembled from an assortment of found objects and fabrics specifically chosen to evoke the essence of each suffragist. Mary Barclay became the first Kentuckian to hold the office of president in a, na in a national women's organization when she was elected president of the American Women's Suffrage Association in 1883. Clay was also the first Kentucky woman to speak publicly on women's rights. She corresponded with Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and Alice Stone Blackwell. Susan's interest in using the shadow as a metaphor for the suffragist is to represent each individual while signifying the universality of the suffrage movement and the paths these women blazed for all of us. The shadow's lack of specificity allows us to see ourselves in them as we are they and they are us. And this is just a really great shot of Susan in her studio to give you a sense of actually how large these prints are. They, they literally take up an entire wall. Um, and on the right hand side is her uh, editing selection process, which I found on um, Instagram. I really just love this a lot. As Shannon Parrish wrote for the NPR picture story, Various tools to communicate and commune with the past, like books, letters, documents, and artifacts from personal and public archives, museums, and libraries are pronounced as can be seen by some of the previous work as well as Carol Erb's photographs of her own family. And questioning whether they voted brings home the point that ratification of the 19th Amendment might not matter if the right to vote isn't exercised. To vote would have been, um, in my estimation, such an achievement. At the same time, there were also women who did not believe that women should have the vote and therefore may have not exercised this privilege even once granted it by government. As Carol Erb said, all five of my images in the exhibit are from photos of my female ancestors who would have been able to vote for the first time in 1920. These, these women are many years gone, so I will never know if they cast their ballots 100 years ago but strong and assertive female personalities populate my family tree. So I would like to believe that they did. I am struck by this as well as another artist who I will speak to um, about later on and about this ability to know someone. There is that adage that when someone dies, a, li a library dies with them. But I would also add that your ability to really know them dies too. A photograph can say a lot, but it can't speak the volume of a person's soul or the choices they make. Photographs are meant to be seen as a document of something real and truthful, but there is so much that is actually left to interpretation and also to re-envision. I like this idea of Carol making this work as a letter to the past instead of making for the future. Also utilizing archival material, Alice Hargrave sources from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to create her images. 
her series is called The Suffragette Bird, and it parallels the timeline of the ratification of the 19th Amendment with the extinction of the passenger pigeon, notably Martha, the last surviving of the species. The work focuses on the importance of the voice, ultimately the importance of the vote. Hargrave says, two images are variations on the suffragette conference of the birds after Farid Attar. I have created a gathering of several female bird calls of diverse species woven together, referencing both the iconic Persian poem from 1177, the conference of the birds, as well as the 100th anniversary of the passage of the amendment. This epic poem recounts a quest in which the birds of the world unite to seek out the truth and the wisdom of the world. They set off on a flight of discovery, a journey in search of a leader. After crossing many obstacles, the valleys of love, unity, detachment, their trajectory leads them to learn that the truth and wisdom was actually within themselves all along. Revealed to them by their own reflections in a lake, they were the leader they set out to find. We need the wisdom of the birds to unite however we can, to vote and summon deep within ourselves to help humanity survive its own short-sightedness. The sound wave patterns of actual bird calls are colored in the natural hues of that specific species. I think these photographs are wonderful examples of diversity and strength within our voices, of the personal histories of each and every one of us and how they affect our daily actions. Like the birds of this story, we may take flight together, but the journey itself will be different for each of us. This is why we must vote for what we believe in. This is why we fight for causes that affect the people we love the most. And this is how we're learning to care for those who may appear different from us. Atar tells us that the truth is not static and that we each tread a path according to our own capacity. It evolves as we evolve. Lisa McCarty uses various artifacts and archival ephemera drawn from public collections around the country to speak to the suffrage movement, the ways women have influenced public opinion through objects such as the mighty pen. Lisa is an artist and educator based in Texas. As a former librarian and archivist, her work explores disruptive technologies, communities, and philosophies across time. In response to the Yellow Rose Project invitation, McCarty became interested in suffrage buttons. Individual suffragists, as well as suffrage organizations, often produced and distributed buttons as a means to visually influence the public. Despite the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, it occurred to McCarty that public opinion was still in need of further influence. Lisa gave a really amazing talk at the town hall at CPAC um, on August 10th, and there she shared some of her research with us. According to a study by the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University, women make up just over half of registered voters, and only 63.3% of eligible women report exercising their right to vote. Additionally, although women make up a slight majority of registered voters, only one in four state legislators are actually women. And as we all know, the greatest glass ceiling in America, po American politics has yet to be broken. Lisa recreated suffrage buttons from the 19th and early 20th century to encourage 21st century women to vote and to vote specifically for women candidates. So I just wanted to briefly talk about two of the pins in her collection and their origins and meanings. So the blue bird was adopted in the summer of 1915. The button was adopted from these pieces, which were die cut tin birds with intense blue and yellow coloring that had votes for women emblazoned down their chests. The prominent placement of November 3rd on their tail feathers confirmed their purpose to remind voters to support the referendum on women's suffrage scheduled for that date. So this one says November 2nd. The National Women's Party awarded silver pins shaped like a jail cell door with a heart-shaped padlock to each of the women who had been jailed for freedom. The pins became one of many important symbols of the women's suffrage movement. This was a movement that began in 1917 when the NWP organized the Silent Sentinels to stand in silent vigil outside of the White House. This was the first time in history the White House was picketed. These women stood outside the fence around the clock to raise awareness for women's suffrage. More than 90 women were arrested through this demonstration for obstructing traffic on a sidewalk. While in prison, they were physically and emotionally abused by guards who beat them and forced them and force fed them when they went on hunger strike. 
The publicity of their mistreatment was instrumental in changing the opinions of the public and of Congress regarding women's suffrage. These women actually went on a tour around the country after their experience and shared to the public um, wearing these actual pins um, in support of their cause. So all in all, there are still many barriers, both social and structural, that prevent women from exercising their right to vote or from realizing their full potential or political influence even today. These buttons can help to serve as a continued reminder of our capacity to create change. So this is just a lovely installation shot from the show at Colorado Photographic Art Center. Lisa made 100 of these pins for that opening um, to commemorate the 100th anniversary. And I just wanted to commemorate that effort um, by showing you uh, what that looked like. I wish I was wearing mine, I was uh, so bad. Um, many women in our project chose to respond to this prompt by photographing women at various stage in, stages in their lives. Carolyn Norton and Betty Press, both with roots in Mississippi, collaborated with women who have had to defend themselves and their right to vote their entire lives. They say, we honor their lives by preserving a glimpse into the courage they embody for making real change against the deep-seated practices and discriminatory Jim Crow laws aimed at excluding them from their constitutional right to vote. Uh, this is Ruby Wilson. And from 1959 to 1962, all black voter applications in Hadesburg, Mississippi were rejected by Theron Lind, the, the county registrar, including Ruby's. Among his tactics for denial was to require black applicants to interpret different difficult sections of the state constitution in writing. When her application was read as evidence in federal court, the judge looked over to Lind and said, I couldn't have interpreted any better myself. Uh, this portrait was taken in front of the courthouse where in 1962, Ruby and 16 other witnesses testified in federal court exposing the discriminatory voting practices. 43 black people had their formally rejected applications approved and left the courthouse as registered voters. This is Ellie Davis Dahmer and she has been celebrated recently receiving an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Southern Mississippi for her contributions to the American Civil Rights Movement and her advocacy for literacy and academic achievement. In 1966, her husband Vernon F. Dahmer was murdered by the KKK the day after he announced that he would pay the poll tax for anyone who wanted to vote but could not afford it. After 12 years as election commissioner in Hattiesburg and after lobbying for the reopening of the case of Vernon's murder in 1998, her efforts resulted in the conviction of a formal imperial wizard. She remarks, the only way I can look at Vernon's death and not cry about it is when I walk in the bank, I see black faces there. You see buses driving, you see black faces on them. You see the police force, you see black faces. Well, his dying did all this. Then it's worth it and he would have done it again. This portrait was taken at the 2020 dedication of a sculpture honoring her husband and his message. If you don't vote, you don't count. And I think it's so important that these stories are being recorded as the voices of these women are the ones being recorded as history. So Rania Matar chose not just to document the young women she collaborated with in her series, but she also decided to collect and share their stories as well. So these young citizens were all coming of age and also becoming first time voters in 2020 election. And therefore, Raina thought it particularly, Rania thought it particularly important in this time to listen and share what they had to say. As a Lebanese born American woman and mother, Rania has cross-cultural experience and a personal narrative of her own that informs the photographs she makes with her subjects. She has dedicated her work to exploring issues of personal and collective identity, through photographs of female adolescence and womanhood, both in the United States and in the Middle East, where she's from. She does, it, she does this in an effort to focus on notions of identity and individuality within the context of the underlying universalities of these experiences. Her series for this project addresses the states of becoming, the fraught beauty and the vulnerability of growing up in the context of the visceral relationships to our physical environment and the universal humanity through collaboration and empowerment. She writes, as a mother of two beautiful young women in their 20s, I'm interested in exploring what it is like to be a girl and a woman today. 
in a world that poses endless questions on girls and women of all backgrounds. As adulthood starts setting in, young women um, everywhere, including my daughters, have to face a new reality they are often not prepared for, a humbling reality that is not nearly as glamorous as the one portrayed on social media. How do they adjust to the challenges of growing up in real life? How do they learn to live and love the life that is in front of them in real place and time? In the immediate future, they can vote and make their voices heard. So these are just some of the women that she collaborated with. As you can tell, they're all over the US. And this is um, Kayla, and I just wanted to read her story for you. Many years ago, my ancestors fought and died for my right to vote. Black men and women sacrificed everything so that I could have the chance and choice to voice how I actually want to live my life. When it comes to voting, matters of feminine health pertaining to rape and abortion rights and laws affect women every day. They affect me every day. Not voting makes it one step closer for a white man I've never met that particularly doesn't even care for my rights solely because I am black and also a woman to then decide for me what I can and cannot to do with my reproductive parts, just to then later publicly and deliberately joke about grabbing me by them. I vote to have a word. Also photographing women who are coming of age, photographer Tracy L. Chandler, who is based in LA, is an artist who explores peripheral communities in her fine artwork and how her own personal story is reflected through portraiture and narrative. She is currently an MFA candidate in the Hartford Art School Limited Residency Program. Chandler writes about her portraits for a Yellow Rose Project. We come to understand ourselves through our reflection in others, a reciprocal knowing that in turn informs our view of the world. As we grow and take on roles, we participate in society, shaping and being shaped by this world we inherit. This awkward dance continues forever, individuals and society growing together, intertwined in beautiful emergence. These images resonate with me as they depict a very vulnerable age in which one is become, beginning to learn about themselves. I love how she refers to it as an awkward dance because what is more uncomfortable than learning truths about yourself, how you exist and are perceived in the world. From such a young age, we are confronted with the mirror of public perception. And I think about kids now growing up with the burden and overexposure uh, via social media and how intensified that process of self-discovery is. It becomes unclear which path is yours when hundreds, if not thousands of people are supplying their input on what that should look like. The election this year looks a bit like this. I feel as if I'm becoming more removed from the web, but I see it on Facebook, posts from people, friends, family that are not even considering their sources, but taking as truth what is supplied to them. It makes me feel protective of these young people to keep them unexposed, but somehow still informed. So it, um, in a number of submissions, we see women, grandmothers, and mothers turning their lens onto the youngest generations within their family line. And with this, we experience something different in the work. For me, looking through mother's eyes, I see the slowing down of time, a present awareness of all things in the frame, a kind of discovery, play, wonder, and even a bit of hope. Focusing on young humans, not yet fully aware of all this world holds in store for them serves as a counterbalance. Ashley Coleman, a Virginian, reared in South Carolina, has lived in rural Mississippi for the last decade and is joined there by her family. As a part of the project, she chose to have conversations with her then seven-year-old daughter. As she states, the children have always come with me to vote and we always talk about the importance of voting. Yet it felt strange to articulate that this year, that we are celebrating 100 years of women being allowed to vote, not that distant a past. It felt even more surreal to explain that while women won the vote, it was not another 40 years before African-American men and women could vote in the South, another staggering reality. And I'll just add here that um, it wasn't until the 80s that Mississippi ratified the 19th Amendment. So as she says, as we continued to talk about voting and human rights over the following months, my mind turned to this idea of metamorphosis, the way change is hidden, slow, painful, with striking moments of wonder and awe. What I found personally um, about all of these images is there's a sense of peace and unfettered joy. 
Here you experience a kind of magic in the scene as the sparkles spray all around the frame, seemingly blown from the small child in the, right, the lower right-hand corner. Then your eye drifts up to the upper left and you see a rosy riveter magnet. This young one, a direct descendant of this iconic woman at a time where white women were empowered and given a certain amount of agency over their lives during World War II. In striking contrast, we then see Letitia Huckabee's work. It is interesting to experience these two one after another. The way in which, again, both women are referencing a past time and fuse that with the current moment using the young ones as the connector to do so. Letitia, a DFW artist, creates multimedia work, combining photography and textiles to depict both family narratives and African-American history. Letitia's Huckabee's work for this project was made as part of a partnership with over 20 girls and young women of color who created their own protest signs that expressed in their words, their work towards suffrage or prayers for the future. The images are printed onto vintage textiles, including sugar sacks, flour sacks, and cotton picking sacks. Huckabee's piece, this one titled Sugar and Spice, includes an image of her 10 year old daughter holding a protest sign that says enough in spray paint. Huckabee's work references Norman Rockwell's painting, the problem we all live with, an iconic image of the civil rights movement. Huckabee's image is printed onto a six foot cotton picking sack that references slavery. The body is property and a means to industry. The word enough was taken from a speech given by Dr. Martin Luther King's nine year old granddaughter, Yolanda Renee King at the March for Our Lives rally in Washington DC in 2019, where she stated, my grandfather had a dream that his four children would not be judged for the color of their skin, but for the content of their character. And I have a dream that enough is enough and that this should be a gun-free world, period. Susan Rosenberg Jones is a New York based artist, portrait and documentary photographer who focuses on home, family and community. Her images have always felt very warm, but highly concerned to me. And maybe because she is one of the first people I met in New York at a Women's Photo Alliance meeting. I feel this sort of connection with her and her images that trans transcend this formal way we think about photography. Rosenberg considered the efforts of the brave and determined women of the suffrage movement who fought for the rights for all women to have an equal voice in the democratic process. And while it was inspiring for her to look back at those before us who bravely spearheaded the movement, she feels the work is not done. Rosenberg has been photographing women who are activists today, women who are proudly working for equal rights and representation for women, as well as for all living things on this planet. Another artist turning their lens on women and giving them a platform and voice when otherwise they would not have one is artist Sarah Bennett. A public defender of 17 years specializing in battered women and the wrongly convicted, Bennett draws attention to the problems of mass incarceration through her photo photographs of women with life sentences. There's just no way one can wade through these images and not be struck with empathy and your own sense of humanity when reading these women's stories. When Work for this Yellow Rose project started to come in. I opened Sarah's work and read this narrative written by Asia. She's age 35 when this photograph was taken. Um, she was incarcerated at age 19 and serving an 18 year to life sentence. Um, this moment of being struck really hit me reading this. And it's in her words and it says, Recently, I spent the night caring for a nine week old baby girl whose mom was removed from the nursery unit. I fed her every three hours and changed her diaper after each feeding. As a nursery aide and doula, I am one of the few women entrusted with caring for precious life and supporting new and experienced mothers. Despite the bad choices that landed me in prison and away from my own children whom have had to grow up without me, I can still make a difference. So as Sarah states, more than 200,000 people in the United States are serving life sentences, a punishment that barely exists in most other Western countries. Since the time I was a public defender, I've believed, as she says, that if judges, prosecutors, and legislature, legislators could just see people who have been convicted of serious crimes as individual human beings, they would rethink the policies that lock them away forever. So before Sarah photographed each of these women, all convicted of homicide, she visited them. 
learning about their lives and quote, it broke my heart to meet a young woman who had been sentenced as a 15 year old to life in prison or to meet a 70 year old who wonders whether she'll die behind bars and all the women in between. Each woman is so much more than the one act that sent her to prison for life. They all are hardworking, resilient, dignified, introspective, and remorseful. They strive to live a meaningful life, to be worthy of our compassion, which leaves us as a society with the question, what do we do with a redeemed life? Our unbelievable host, Aline Smithson, an advocate for photographers and a superhero to many, also contributed work to this project and hosted it on Lens Scratch the day of the launch, which was very exciting to have it like fully out into the world. <laughs> Thank you for all you do, Eileen. Uh, these photographs are from a series called Women I Don't Know, which stems from a larger series, People I Don't Know. Um, she states, in order to infuse life into the images, which are vernacular images um, that she collected in order to kind of place her self in this time in the 20s of women that were living then. Um, back to her statement. I asked someone of the same gender and approximately the same age to hold the photograph, leaving room for the viewer to connect with the living who have passed on. Psychologically, we attach the face in the photograph to the body that holds it, creating a new relationship. I feel a quiet satisfaction with these people that I don't know are again appreciated, held with held and recognized with dignity. I feel like this project speaks so much to this idea and respect that we are paying to the women who have fought for our rights today, who we will never meet. The tenderness of these pictures have a maternal quality to them. And I feel comforted by them as guiding lights in this crazy dark time. Me too, here, here. Um, various women in our project chose to focus on historical figures many of whom um, were overlooked by history or forgotten. Some have opted to highlight our everyday unsung heroes. Yet one woman chose to highlight the more publicly known, the ones that have been written into history and are making waves today politically. So this is Elizabeth and Elizabeth. Sherry Lynn Bear is no stranger to making waves either, um, the author of these images. A Bronx gal who grew up to photograph rock stars like Iggy Pop, Patti Smith, and Deborah Harry, she has been published in Rolling Stone, Cream Magazine, and countless books to boot. For this series, she turned her eye to the celebrity, so to speak, of the women's movement. Each image in this suite shares portraits of women in politics now and women in politics in the not so distant past. As they gather from her images, one makes way for the next. As you see here, Elizabeth Warren, former law professor who is a senior senator from Massachusetts serving since 2013, and surfacing from behind her is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, one of the mothers of the suffrage movement, the organizers of the 1848 Com convention in Seneca Falls, and one of the primary authors of the Declaration of Sentiments. These vibrant prints and pop-like renderings reference Andy Warhol's screen prints of various celebrities such as Marilyn Monroe and Jacqueline Kennedy, as well as the iconic Barack Obama Hope poster designed by artist Shepard Ferry, which came to re represent his 2008 presidential election. In contrast to the style of these two men, which overlay contrasting colors and produce a flat mash-like artificial visage, Bear creates depth with the underlying black and white images. And in my opinion, this mimics the depth of the women represented, such as the striking magenta yellow print of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. At first glance, all we see is her, then emerging from the background, an image of Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Anita Chisholm was the first African-American woman elected to the United States Congress, representing New York's 12th Congressional District, and held that position for seven terms between 69 and 83. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, also known by her initials, AOC, is currently serving as US representative for New York's 14th Congressional District. A clear point of connection here as they share a surface with one another, one holding the next one up. What I also love about this image is that the women are looking in opposite directions as if they see it all. Furthermore, the expression is one of vision and future. As Bear states, 100 years ago, women won the right to vote. 
Today, their spiritual descendants win elections. Behind them are the ghosts of suffragettes and those who were the first to win. This year, we celebrate them all. Another artist um, using manipulated imagery is Sarah Russell, who is an artist and curator based in Seattle. She often uses advertising and editorial images as she transforms what is intended to sell or influence into a space of meditation, compassion, and protest. Her first monograph, Tears, Tears, published in 2019 by Yaffe Press, features collages created during and in response to the first 100 days of the 45th presidency. The work created for a Yellow Rose Project focuses on the history and identity and erasure of the First Ladies, identity erasure. The series is titled The First Ladies Club or How to Get a Woman in the Oval Office. The works are derived from the archive of Vogue magazine of past and present First Ladies of the United States. Russell states, the work uses the experience and representation of a First Lady to reflect on the position and perception of women in the United States. Where is her power? How does public perception adorn, admire, idealize, and imitate her? What do we see when we gaze at these faces dissolving into the background? Are they wallpaper, decor, fixture, mirage? What becomes of their likeness when they enter the Oval Office? These women are not seen through their own experiences. They are first and foremost viewed through the lens of their husbands. His job creates her position. His choices are now her responsibility. His opinions are now hers as well or risk being the woman who does not stand by her man. She must always remember that the first lady is not elected. She comes to her position by marriage, not votes. This is a blessing and a curse, a power and a trap. His presidency seals her fate. Like all women, first ladies are complex. They have their own opinions. We can and should allow ourselves to hate them, love them, respect them, ignore them, but it is perhaps at the erasing that is the most painful. Here is another project that is speaking to erasure, particularly the identity of the first lady. In her book, Becoming, Michelle Obama reminds us, if you don't get out there and define yourself, you'll be quickly and inaccurately defined by others. Regardless of political affiliation or background, uh, we have made, we need to make the effort to support women as pillars in society. The freedom to choose between candidates and validate their own existence via the vote has been the forefront of activism since the beginning of the suffrage movement. It is not always red or blue, left or right, but about gender neutrality and respect within our government. So this piece is by Larissa Ramey. Um, she's a multimedia artist who primarily works with photography. Her work displays themes about race, identity, body image, and ecology concerns. Currently, she lives in Leesburg, Virginia, and is actually one of the youngest to participate in our project. Um, I found out the other night through one of our fireside chats. And as she cites, Larissa is making work that challenges her to explore the relationships, environments, and roles of her identity as a biracial woman and artist. The act of documenting her environments and interpreting levels of her identity through imagery has given her the ability to pass through experiences and expand upon her own self-worth, thus allowing her to acknowledge her heritage, ancestry, and the present landscapes that have forged a connection towards the meaning of place in her practice. And so this is actually a poem um, that she created um, through this article, and I'll just read it to you here because I find it really profound. Dirty hands, cheat and profess, I lay low, numb most of me, art, celebration, extinction, dominate me. The longer you play, the better you get at making good decisions. Walk in and own the world, often. Reasoning can seem hands-on for alternative approach. Acquire a sense of what isn't, lay low, then cheat. I know art. I am who I am, an artist, on several occasions, scratched out, period. The word that comes to mind when I look at this work of Ramey's is didacting. That through this exercise of blacking out, circling, and creating anew, she is teaching us something morally inherent. Something as humans we all should, and if not should, then we all need to know. 
This is a poem, obviously unique and unto her, but it feels to me like visual navigation of a young woman's experience in this moment in time, especially in this context and time. And for me, it feels like code breaking and or code making. Some artists are casting a critical eye on those in political power or favor, and they advocate for reform by exposing those at the top. Caitlin Copenhaver is a New York City based artist working in photography, video, performance, and installation. She remarks that she is preoccupied with societal oversight, crucial moments that are seen but forgotten, the glimpse of an act between two people that alarms us, an instant where we ask ourselves, should I intervene? I find that her work is unapologetic and incredibly sincere. Her photographs are documents of a performance she conducted at the beginning of the pandemic in March, carrying and displaying what she calls the predator banner and covering the footsteps of the horrific offenders, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. I think in a time where we are faced with truths and exposed information, we are skeptical and cautious of what we decide to celebrate and support. Caitlin's work seems to have a finger hovering over the panic button, and she's not afraid to alert others of information she uncovers. We need to remain vigilant and keep our eyes open to the atrocities happening right under our noses. Her photographs and performances highlight the violence that surrounds us, and especially as women, the precautions we need to take and the hyper-awareness that is necessary of us to survive. Uh, this, these are works by Greer Muldowney, who is an artist, educator, champion of photography, and curator based in Boston area. Her photographs speak directly to policymaking and how it affects landscape, housing, and community. As a stalwart advocate for photography students, she is the, is the founder and director of Undergraduate Photography Now, which is an organization that supports the work and professional development of these students. She was recently appointed assistant, photograph assistant professor of photography at Boston College. She calls this series rhetorical history and says, small words have such seminal impacts, especially those forgotten by history or falsified to bolster it. Quotations are often taken out of context or attributed to new meanings in every era. So it was no surprise to find the words that really did make a difference or in many accounts haunt us had either been forgotten or her had not occurred at all. The Journal's Truth Ain't I a Woman speech, which was originally given at the 1851 Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron has been the enduring message of the plight of intersectional feminism. The phrase, never, the phrase never actually appeared in the original text, added years later to have a more Southern twang. And originally a no vote by Representative Harry Burns and his, and his emblazoned red rose, his mother wrote him a long letter that included only one sentence to implore her son to, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. It is said that this cajoling has changed the history for the amendment that would change the course of our history. What a precarious thought in a casual letter. I chose these two phrases for how stark they were in contrast and effect, also how gendered they were and how this comes down to human rights, but through that lens. I really appreciate this critical eye placed by Greer on these sort of catch phrases utilized in the telling of history along with a photograph. A caption can hold such great responsibility and photography has always had a trustworthiness imposed on it whether the material and delivery are factual or not. This medium is riddled with falsities, but we often refer to photographs for truth. We fabricate as much as we erase. Growing up in the American South and currently residing in Lexington, Virginia, Krista has always felt a deep connection to home, place, nature, and the way that these things intertwine, like overgrown muscadine vines becoming part of an aged tree. She spent most of her time outdoors as a child and has always felt the most at peace in nature. The connection between place, family are inextricably bound together in her work. When walking in the woods, seeking subjects, Krista says she can't help but think of her grandmother collecting native plants, seeds, and specimens for her garden, or her mother identifying which plants are ed edibles, um, which must not be touched. It is these things that she has in mind as she makes images and with that, she says, I am able to visually elevate and evaluate subjects and how they serve as metaphors, connecting my past to present and place to people. So this piece by Krista 
speaks about her first memory of voting with her grandmother in the 1980 election in which the grandmother cast her ballot for Jim Jimmy Carter. It shares with us a sweet exchange between two different generations and their decisions for voting in the more pivotal elections of our lifetime, that of a black man and that of a woman. She shares the negotiation here. It is a very personal but universal experience, I am sure. Many Americans have across dinner tables and phone calls as family members reach out to one another in hopes of influencing or connecting in these times of great social change. The subject, is this, the subject in this piece looks fragile and personifies the emotional qualities expressed in the sentiment written on top of it. I also enjoy thinking about the symbolic nature of this matter too. A ginkgo is considered a living fossil. It has no living relatives and is the oldest surviving species tree known to exist with a botanical history spanning more than 200 million years. This in itself makes it a symbol of resiliency. And I find this image to be quite strong in its vulnerability which I suppose makes me think of what is needed for our country right now, a sense of strength and open vulnerability. We have a couple more. Uh, Diane Mayer is another artist who uses text paired with an extensive stitching process. She has exhibited all over the world from Dresden to Chicago, Malaysia to the Netherlands, Canada and Austria. And since 2005 has found her base in Los Angeles. Diane's work is tactile and complicated and I'll never forget handling her frames when showing them at the Griffin years ago. She frames her stitch pieces with plexiglass on the back so you can see all the handiwork that goes into it. The loose thread creates its own tapestry. For this project, Diane states, my piece centers around a quote from Maxine Waters from a television interview on MSNBC. She says, I'd like to say to women out there everywhere, don't allow these dishonorable people to intimidate you or scare you. Be who you are, do what you do. Her diptych from Rochester tells the story of Susan B. Anthony's arrest and accompanies the image with her own story of visiting the gravestone of Anthony right before the 2016 election, presuming we would be electing our first woman president soon after. Seeing the stone covered in I voted stickers struck an optimistic and excited chord and then was replaced with grief and disappointment. She notes the sadness in knowing the millions of eligible voters did not cast their vote that year. And I have to say, it's been a really amazing experience to stand in line with hundreds of people to vote early this year in New York City. And the undercurrent of protest within that vote is so powerful. She said she chose the diptych as a nod to the style of a traditional embroidered sampler created by women in the 18th and 19th century and seen as an example of women's work. So another artist that is using hand-sewn elements within her work is Marina Font, an artist who's been working in this vein for the past nine years in conjunction with images of the female body. When she spoke recently at the CPAC town hall, she shared some of her insight into the process of making and I'm gonna share that with you because it was so wonderful. Marina grew up in Argentina and spoke of how the environment, literature and culture influenced the work, especially growing up there as she pinpointed in a patriarchal household as well as society. Argentinians, she noted, were very influenced by Freud and his theory of psychoanalysis. And this attachment disturbed Marina, in particular, this idea of a woman's body and sexuality being a dark continent, quote unquote. This phrase was extracted from colonialism, she said, those countries that were unexplored and had not been conquered. Font uses the female body in many of her pieces, this one, the body is proportional to those that would be found, she explains, in an anatomy book, positioned very clinically. The pose itself could also reference like the yoga pose, the mountain pose, religious iconographic paintings, but most, is, most important for her, it is meant to represent openness and vulnerability. The body to her became the continent and the topographic surface, the embroidery that she lays into it. The resulting embellishments are expressions of the body and experiences from a female perspective, the intent of which is to blur distinctions between the inside and the outside of the body. So as a really interesting story and kind of a recap um, before we end up opening this up to questions, we were um, recently interviewed by a young woman um, at UNM for the Daily Lobo and her name is Sarah Rose. And she asked us, you know, out of all these pictures, which one um, do you, you know, that sticks out in your mind or is burned in your mind or kind of represents the whole. And 
Francis and I had never prepared the answer for something like that. So we just, you know, immediately kind of answered and our favorite one, well, our, we love all of the images so much, but the one that we both had said was this, this very same image. And so if you can think about the fact that there's 105 women, roughly, you know, one to five images each. And so that's like 525 photographs if you do the quick map. So this, just to explain, is kind of the experience I've had throughout this entire project and collaboration with Francis, where every step of the way we've been sort of like in sync. And um, yeah, I wanted to share that with you guys, um, but also that we just love this picture and all the photographs that um, have been, um, you know, given to this project and shared with us. And Francis, I will let you talk about this image. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, it's been an amazing process to work with all of these women in the, in the project and you, Meg, I mean, we've, we've taken this on as, as our like love and second full-time job, second, third full-time jobs. <laughs> but anyway, I agree that there's something magical about this image. It speaks to the rising up like a Phoenix, but the flame is still present representing our everyday battle that still continues. I feel like as a woman, we have to play defense so much of our time. And this figure in Marina's image is so strong and encourages confidence to stand our ground. Uh, I feel really inspired by all of the images from a Yellow Rose project each time I look at them and it feels like we're learning something every single day, every time we interact with these pictures. So thank you all to everybody involved and thanks for listening to us tonight. <laughs> all right. So you can share your videos now and do some clapping for these amazing uh, curators um okay so you can stop yeah here we go okay wow i mean that was an incredible presentation and it really speaks to the deep research that you have both done on this subject and i really think that this whole effort shows the power of community the power of making something happen because you've made something happen and the power of photography to inspire and document. I mean, bravo to you, incredible effort. It's just, it's some ways mind blowing. Um, so please ask your questions now. I'm gonna throw a few out here. Um, a few, about a month ago, I was in conversation with Raymond Thompson um, about who is creating work based on the revisiting of archives, but seen through the black perspective. But in your research for this project, what did you learn that was historically inaccurate or altered to shed light on particular individuals? Yeah, I mean, Francis and I, when we started, um, and we spoke about this multiple times, when we started, uh, we were thinking this was going to be like a celebration, and we we very quickly found out that it um, wasn't a celebration for all, and it wasn't like how they talk about things in the history books, and I'll just take like one of the examples. Um, so, you know, we know as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton as these two women were at Seneca Falls in 1848 and like all the stuff started there. And I quickly realized after doing some research that it started much earlier. It started in London. It started with a woman named Lucretia Mott who Elizabeth Cady Stanton met. 1848, Susan B. Anthony wasn't even there. Like they wrote her in later. I mean, there's all these kinds of things that happen. And also, um, you know, Elizabeth and Susan B. Anthony wrote like the first essential collection of like women's history about the suffrage movement. They definitely wrote themselves in and they most definitely wrote other women out, most specifically women of color, but also people like Alice Paul. And so there was all this stuff that in sort of our preliminary even, and we kept digging and digging and digging. And so did these other women we were working with and people would, you know, write us and be like, oh my gosh, this is what I found out. And we'd be like, I know this is, this is just like this amazing sort of uncovering, which um, makes me feel much more rooted in the reality 
of what our movement was about and about the sort of segregation and you know racial epithets and elitism and all of the other things we are still dealing with today. So, um, but that's that's just like that's just the tip of the iceberg of stuff that you know I sort of uncovered in my research and. I know Francis has too, and it's been enlightening, really. Yeah, I, and I'm sure there's more to uncover. I feel like all history needs to be rewritten. Um, so this is such a critical time for in women's history to vote. Um, we've seen an administration that wants to remove our rights as women um and suppress voting in many states so how do you have any ideas of how we can take this movement further i think really being aware of the suppression tactics that are happening you know i think this year brought up a lot of information that we didn't really realize was happening unless you were directly affected by it and i think knowing those sort of avenues that um, you could go down to, to protect your vote, you know, you know, before the month before an election and this sort of um, solidifying your, your registration um, is, a, is, a, is a huge deal and helping others to do so. And, you know, spreading the word of, of all these things that could potentially go wrong when you're trying to cast a vote and, you know, being being support systems for one another, I think is, is our best way to, um, to, to get us all activated and in line and to vote and to not be stopped once you wait in line for three hours and get to the table and be turned away. So I think like our, our constant communication is, is what's gonna help us continue yeah. this movement. Yeah, and I would add to that photography, like, Instagram, like all of these ways in which we share because photography, yes, is most definitely still uses this document of like reality. And as we've seen in the movements over this summer, people sharing images and videos and sharing experiences like in real time. I mean, it's just so important um, when you share and especially during, you know, this time of like being virtual, we're all glued to Instagram and Facebook and the internet. So it's, you know, sharing connecting through sharing through our medium specifically you know because that's our language right um, it's really important well you just answered my next question because uh when i'm chatting with both of you earlier you shared with me that um a reporter asked you why photography like why is that the medium that you've selected and i've always considered photography to be the most universal language in the world. And um, so you just answered it, um, you know, why photography? Uh, but if you wanna to speak to any of that. Well, I think we both got a little jazzed up about it when we were talking earlier this week, but I've always been fascinated. I mean, to, to tie in a couple of conversations that are overlapping here is like the trustworthiness of photography, the universe, like the universal approach that we have to images that we can recognize, you know, the human, human species in, in a different way. Um, but also how photography has been treated as a document, as, as a news source, um, but also is very easily manipulated with text and how history is written and utilizes imagery um, in ways to support whatever you're trying to say. It's very, it's a kind of a precarious balance, which I could talk, talk about every day. Well, you're both getting a lot of love in the chat. And um, I hope, Brandon, we can save the chat and send it to them or Jason. Um, but I, I mean, I'm curious about how this took over your life. Um, you know, when you started this, was it two years ago to be that you came up with the idea and then the research and the reaching out and then every place that it's gone beyond? I mean, it's probably taken a huge part of your, taken away from your own creative life mm -hmm. and um, 
I don't know if you want to share any of that because I it's profound what you have done, truly. I mean, thank you. Um, thank you so much. I mean, it's just wonderful to be like in a space acknowledged for all of that. But you know, like Francis had said earlier, it's um, it really is a labor of love. I mean. I have commented multiple times with people who text me about various things. Like, I feel like it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. I mean, I am an artist, so I love making my own personal juice of the work from my body, you know, that's just mine. But um, there really is something, you know, as to what you were talking about before too, I mean, this community and collaboration connecting in this way. Um, connecting in this very like soulful heartfelt way I mean all these women are like sharing their 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 things with us you know and we get to dive into that and read through that and wade through it and like try it on and swim around and um but yeah I mean it is a lot of work but like it was so much work for all these women to make the work and so how could we not you know keep going as long and also the context and also the 2020 election, we had no thought of that this would all be like a confluence of events, you know, we didn't, we didn't know. Yeah. So yeah, Francis, you could say. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that it's grown beyond we could, what we could have ever even imagined for it. And the response and, you know, the timing that it's all happening, it feels, it feels like an important mission for us. Like, uh, um, it's our it's our form of activism in this way of of getting this work out into the world and these conversations happening. So yeah, it's a lot of work, and you know we, but we enjoy it, and we're tied to all of these people who are a part of it, and we're you know the gratefulness outweighs the exhaustion. <laughs> Say that. Well, just in your descriptions of what of the work that you shared, just your deep thinking and consideration of everything is is really pretty remarkable. Um, Raula, I may be pronouncing that wrong, who is a wonderful curator in her own right for Humble Arts, uh, asked the question, um, now that you've delivered this project to the world, what, if anything, would you do differently? I, I think for, for me, it's like a kind of like a very surface level answer to this, Rula. I'm sorry, we could talk about this later also. But the, t the timing is so specific. So we had the launch on August 18th, which is like when it first went out into the world. And then all of these really great things started happening after. So I think like if we had had some more planning, I mean, this was all happening during COVID too, which was insane. Um, but to have all of these kind of shows come out on the 18th and to have all of this like release out into the world for that date in August, I wonder how that would have been um, received differently if what sort of press would pick it up because it was such a specific date or, um, or even just screenings and things. But you know what, We're, we learned and um, I think we've had a lot of success for, for the, the timing. Yeah, that. I mean, you had Black Lives Matter, you had the COVID pandemic, you had so many things um, sort of competing for the, you know, for the attention and, but I still think, you, you know, this is such a powerful project and message that it's it's getting out there and will continue to you know make its way but i, I still go go back to the idea of like the idea of just considering an idea and making it happen and yeah. then getting everybody on board i mean as you said not everybody came on board but i think that there is a incredible community in photography especially with women who are so willing to help each other and to be participate in various things and um you know it's it's pretty we're pretty lucky this is really a remarkable community to be making work in incredibly supportive 
for sure. Um, so um, let me see if there's any last questions. There's just love, love, love. So um, Gail's question of, would you consider a Yellow Rose Project 2? Like all good movies, we have to have a, uh, a part due. <laughs> Well, I mean, you guys are in the land of like LA, but we all know that like part two is watered down soup, right? So, um, <laughs> hey, <laughs> maybe that's blasphemy to say in the city of angels. Um, our plan, our plan is to do something else. It won't be this, it will be another project, but we're definitely planning on doing another project. It's, I don't think it's going to be about the 19th Amendment. And I don't think it's going to be about even maybe with the same women. I mean, we just want this, like, we created something, right? Like you said, we had an idea, we got together, had some drinks at APAD, and we're like, let's do this. And um, we created, we've created a platform. And the most important thing, I think, if we've learned anything from this summer is, especially if you have white people you should create a platform and share it and so you know that might be a portent for something coming in the future but and we don't know exactly what that looks like because we're still on this train but um we definitely want to we're, we're going to share the mic share the platform and do something else with more women collaborating in our medium because we would love to see what that looks like you know yeah and i i really throw it out to everyone in the audience like Think about what you can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's such an exciting time. We are all connected virtually in one way or another. And um, there is power in community. So, well, thank you both for an incredible evening, an incredible project. Uh, wow. I mean, I hope you read these comments in the chat. You are so appreciated and beloved, and uh, it's such an impressive effort. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to LACP for hosting this evening, so. Thank you too, Aline. Thank you for everything you do. Thank, thank you, you everyone for coming. Thank you everyone. Well, Everyone in the project, everyone not in the project, we love you all. Thank you for sharing space and time with us tonight. We so appreciate you. Thank <laughs> you.